Good morning, ladies. How are you doing today? Good. Well, I'm really excited and honored to be here. Go ahead and have a seat. My name is Zenovia, and um, I'm a high school Spanish teacher by day and a virtue girl by night. So this is a special treat to be able to fellowship with you this morning. Why don't you go ahead and open up to Esther 2, and we'll begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you, and first and foremost, we declare you as Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Lord, as we study the, the book of Esther, Lord, we see your provision over and over, Lord, and we know it's by no accident. And Lord, as we continue in this morning studying and fellowshipping, Father God, we just ask that if there was anything that we said or did or thought from the time we woke up this morning to the time we walked into the sanctuary, Lord, that you would forgive us. Lord, we confess it now. We don't want anything to hinder what you have to say to us. And Lord, we thank you for your word, that it's alive and powerful, Father. And we ask right now, Lord, this International Day of Women, how fitting that we would be here as women, Lord, that you would speak to your daughters. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, wasn't this such a rich chapter? Didn't it give you hope that the Lord can work in any situation? We have a family friend named Pat who plays Santa every year in various locations and malls. And last year, he and his wife were given the opportunity to play Santa and Mrs. Claus in China, a predominantly atheist country. At one of the hotels where he stayed, he met a young woman from Kenya named Christina. She was working in the hotel. And um, every time Pat was out in public and saw her, he couldn't talk to her because he was bombarded with people wanting to see Santa. He was like a rock star over there. But God had a plan. One day, nobody was around, and Pat started a conversation with Christina. She shared that she just found out she was pregnant. Her boyfriend, a fellow worker at the hotel, was away for Christmas. She was scared, and she was alone. And it's important to note that Pat is a pastor at a Calvary chapel. Pat shared the love of God with her, and she was eternally grateful. And Pat told me, I know that I was sent there for Christina. Girls, God sent Santa to China to share the love of Christ with a girl from Kenya who was all alone. God can work anywhere. Amen? Well, let's dive in, beginning in verse 1. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. The first thing that uh, popped out to me were the first three words after these things. What were these things? When we studied Esther last week, we learned that the king threw a six-month party for all his officials to display his wealth and gain their support and admiration. In his drunkenness, he summoned his wife, Queen Vashti. He wanted everyone to see her beauty, but she refused to go. Feeling angry and humiliated by her disobedience, his advisors suggested that he make a law that would remove Vashti from her royal position, and he agreed. Now, four years had gone by between Vashti's removal as queen and the events that take place in Esther II. King Ahasuerus invaded Greece, and it did not go as planned. Feeling dejected and weak, he wanted to be comforted by his wife. But even as king, his law that, ban that banished Vashti could not be reversed. And there are some things that we can learn from this situation. Number one, we see the consequences of decisions made without seeking wise counsel. That is, counsel based in the word of God. Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Number two, we see the consequences of decisions based on emotions rather than wisdom. The king was angry, and he made that law out of pride. Proverbs 14, 21, people with understanding control their anger. A hot temper shows great foolishness. And number three, we see the consequences of drinking alcohol. You may argue that you have certain liberties, but ladies, though alcohol may not be your struggle or your temptation, we cannot exercise our liberties if it will cause someone else to stumble. And the Bible is very clear on this. 
Romans 14, 21. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. Matthew 18, 7. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. Girls, if the Lord is saying woe to something, then we need to say no to that thing. Let's continue reading in verse 2. Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan, the citadel, into the women's quarters, under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women. And let beauty preparations be given them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. In Shushan the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai. Verse 7. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard, and when many young women were gathered at Shushan the citadel under the custody of Haggai, that Esther also was taken to the king's palace into the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. I've titled this message, Majestic Makeover, because we are daughters of the king of kings, and we are royal, we are royal daughters. I have three points to share with you today. Number one is stand firm. Number two is strip away. And number three is step forward. I have a friend named Liz. She works in the Virtue office. And last summer we were talking and I asked her how she and her husband became a couple. Liz had given her life to the Lord shortly before meeting Andrew, her husband. When Andrew expressed his desire to court her, Liz had no idea what a Christian relationship should look like. She hadn't grown up in a Christian home. But Andrew had. Even the thought of not kissing at the beginning of a relationship was foreign to her. But thankfully, Andrew knew that starting off with what many might consider an innocent gesture could easily tempt them and cause them to sin. And Andrew desired to protect both his and her purity. The Lord had given her this precious gift in Andrew because she didn't know a whole lot about being a Christian woman according to God's standards. But she wanted to be obedient to God. So as Liz is telling me her story, she said something that, sh that stuck with me. She said, I didn't know much, but I was passionate about what I did know. Liz had decided to stand firm on what she knew about God, even in the unknown territory into which she was stepping. My first point is stand firm. Stand firm on what you know about God and surrender what you don't know about your circumstance. What we know about Esther is that she was an orphan who was raised by her older cousin, cousin Mordecai. She was a virgin, she was young, she was beautiful, and she was a Jew. So this decree to take all the beautiful young virgins in search of the one who would be crowned queen was a life-altering, devastating reality for Esther. Remember, she was a Jew, and she believed in the living God. This is not the way God would ever treat a woman. Many refer to this chapter as the first beauty contest, and it was, but it was also the worst beauty contest. When Esther was chosen, she knew what it meant for her life. She was going to be part of a harem. Do you know what a harem is? It's a place where Eastern princes confine their women who are prohibited from the society of others. These young women were taken into this harem where they would compete to be queen. They would be judged on their beauty and sexual performance. They were kept away from their families and the rest of society. They would spend their entire lives without any possibility of a dignified future, with no chance of a normal life, no chance to ever fall in love, get married, have children. Life as they knew it was over. And Esther knew this. I'm sure that she had imagined her life completely differently. I'm sure that she had been praying about the day when she would meet a nice Jewish boy and settle into a life as a wife and mother, teaching her children about the God of Israel. But now as her life had taken an unexpected, seemingly disappointing turn, Esther had a choice. She could succumb to fear or devastation about her circumstance, 
or she could stand firm on what she knew about the Lord and surrender what she didn't know about her circumstance. And that's exactly what she did. Now, I've never been called into a harem, but I do understand to a degree the sorrow that Esther may have experienced about crushed dreams. Currently, right now, I have a benign mass in my stomach that's the size of a woman's womb when she's 23 weeks pregnant. So it's about a, a six-month womb. Um, it's causing other issues as it presses against various organs in my body. And the placement of this mass makes removing it a great challenge if I ever want to have a child. And I do want to have a child. And as I pray about my options for treatment and I deal with the daily pain and discomfort, I'm choosing to stand firm on what I know about the Lord. <laughs> Here's some things that I know about him. He is good and he does good. His will is perfect. His ways and his thoughts are higher than mine. He loves me. He cares for me. He is with me. He will never leave me or forsake me. He is for me. He goes before me. He will give me perfect peace. He intercedes for me. He will strengthen me. He will help me. He will uphold me. His grace is sufficient. His will, he will supply all my needs. No good thing will he withhold from me. His plans for me are good to give me a future and a hope. Yeah, I'm standing firm on these truths and surrendering what I don't know about my circumstance. And when my legs get wobbly and I feel like I'm going to fall, I have friends who know the word of God. And they have wisdom and discernment. They know when to speak his word directly to me and when to just stay silent and pray his word over me. It's a choice, ladies, and I'm choosing to let go of what I believe I'm entitled to and trust in God. And the Lord is asking each of you to do the same. Will you stand firm and surrender? You had dreams, you prayed, you fasted. All you want is a baby from your womb, but you're barren. You had dreams of growing old with the love of your life, and now you're a widow. Or you saw the death of your marriage through divorce. You have dreams of seeing your children walk with the Lord, yet they continue to rebel against God. You had dreams that you and your husband would serve the Lord together, but it's clear that as your walk grows stronger, his walk is growing weaker. You had dreams of having a healthy baby, but your child has a physical or mental incapacity that will disallow him or her to live a normal life. You had dreams of seeing your children grow up, and have children of their own. But instead, you had to arrange their funeral. Ladies, in the midst of the deepest sorrow, he is asking you, will you stand firm on what you know about him and surrender what you don't know about your circumstance? Perhaps you haven't experienced a tragedy, but you face an unknown future. You're the woman who desires to be married and the years are passing you by. Or you're the woman whose financial circumstance leaves you wondering how next month's bills are going to be paid. Or you're the woman who feels like you're just going through the motions with no real impact or purpose. Will you stand firm and surrender? Ladies, even when we feel as though God is distant and quiet, he is working on our behalf amid chaos, pain, and uncertainty. The beloved late Reverend Billy Graham once said, Someone asked me recently if I didn't think God was unfair, allowing me to have Parkinson's and other medical problems when I have tried to serve him faithfully. I replied, I did not see it that way at all. Suffering is part of the human condition, and it comes to us all. The key is how we react to it, either turning away from God in anger and bitterness or growing closer to him in trust and confidence. Jesus is our greatest example of one who um, stood firm and surrendered. In Matthew 26, 39, it says, He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. We must stand firm on what we know about the Lord and surrender what we don't know about our circumstance. Are you willing to say, I don't know much, but I'm passionate about what I do know. 
Let's continue reading in verse 9. Now the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favor, so he readily gave beauty preparations to her besides her allowance. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. Verse 11, halfway in. Each young woman's turn came to go in to King Ahasuerus after she had completed 12 months' preparation according to the regulations for the women, for thus were the days of their preparation apportioned, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king. Verse 15, now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of, of Ahab, excuse me, Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king. She requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. My second point today is strip away. Strip away what's masking the beauty of Christ in you. Plainly said, strip away the ugly. Each of the women who were chosen for the king's harem were already beautiful, and Esther, while breathtakingly beautiful, still had to go through the required beauty preparations before she could be brought before the king, consisting of six months of oil of myrrh and six months of perfumes and other preparations. I researched the purpose and benefits of oil of myrrh as it was used in biblical times. When used correctly, this oil inhibits microbial growth. That means that it disallows microbes to grow and infect your system. I don't know what a microbe is, but it's bad. <laughs> it was used as an astringent, so it strengthens the parts of your body that are already working po uh, properly, and it smooths the skin. It fights viral and fungal infections. It stimulates the nervous system so that your heart and your brain function as they should. It improves digestion so that what you take into your body can be broken down properly. It removes toxins from your body. It speeds up healing. It boosts your immune system to keep you healthy. It stimulates blood circulation so that you receive adequate oxygen to your tissues. It relieves spasms. It's an anti-inflammatory, and it protects your overall health. Those six months of treatments that Esther received were meant to do all this. It was part of the purification process. And ladies, like Esther, you are all beautiful. Do you know this about yourselves? The Bible, the word of God says so. You are beautiful. In Psalm 90, 17, it says that God is beautiful. And in Genesis 127, it says that God created us in his own image. And as image bearers of God, you are all beautiful. Tell the woman to your right, you are beautiful. Now tell the woman to your left, you are breathtaking. We are beautiful ladies, but like Esther, we too have a purification process to undergo. And it's not a six month treatment, it's a lifelong process. We need to be purified so that we can act and think properly to protect our overall spiritual health because our sin, our character flaws, and our negligence of our spiritual life distract from the beauty of Christ in us. A few years ago, I decided that I needed to start taking preventative measures to keep my skin looking good. Now, don't judge too harshly, girls. I was single, okay? And I felt like I needed to do what I could so I don't scare away any prospects, you know? Totally ineffective, okay? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I just prefer skincare over makeup, except for today, because that camera is no joke. <laughs> so... I purpose to get a facial every three months. I mean, who doesn't love to get pampered, right? Wrong. I went in for my first appointment, and since my goal was really for maintenance purposes, I was open to whatever the esthetician wanted to do. So she started cleansing my face and did an examination of my skin. Honestly, I was expecting her to confirm that I had nice skin. That was not what she told me. She said, you have dehydrated patches of skin. I I'm sorry, what now? I was stunned to learn that I had areas of neglect. But she's the expert, and it wasn't the worst news in the world. So she recommended a pumpkin peel, and when she started to smear the peel on my face, it smelled like pumpkin pie. I thought, oh, this is nice. Pumpkin pie, getting pampered, wrong again. Within a few seconds, my face started to sting like nobody's business. 
I'd never had a peel, and while the word peel should have given me some sort of clue, I was still kind of dumb about what was happening. A peel is a treatment in which the outer layers of skin are exfoliated, revealing a new skin layer with improved tone, texture, and color. So needless to say, my perceived pampering experience was not going as I had hoped. But the pain soon subsided. She washed everything off and went on to the next step. This was my favorite step. She placed a machine where this wonderfully smelling steam was wafting over my face. And as this happened, she was massaging my arms and my legs. And I thought, oh yeah, this is what I paid for. <laughs> Wrong, once again. You see, the steam had a purpose which was revealed rather quickly. The steam was designed to open my pores and reveal the imperfections below the surface of my skin. And these imperfections needed to be dealt with in the most effective way possible. Do you know what came next? Extractions, ladies. <laughs> Extractions. My eyes begin to water just thinking about it. This is the process by which the esthetician locates the foreign, unhealthy, toxic matter and removes it by pressing and prodding and digging down deep until it finally comes up and out of your pores. This did not feel good. I wanted to cry. Suddenly I thought, this is what I paid for? I wanted to smack her hand away and jump off that table. It hurt, it was uncomfortable, but it was needed because what she extracted was distorting what I was meant to look like. My skin needed to be stripped away of the ugly, and after the extractions had ended, she moisturized my face and gave me instructions on how to proceed and properly care for my skin. And it's like that with the Word of God if we're faithful to study His Word each day. I mean, thank God for Thursdays and Virtue Bible study, but we need daily attention. His Word is meant to beautify us. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed, given by divine inspiration, and is profitable for instruction, for conviction of sin, for correction of error and restoration to obedience, for training in righteousness, learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly, here's the kicker, and privately, behaving honorably with personal integrity and moral courage so that the man or woman of God may be complete and proficient, outfitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Yes, we are beautiful, but we still have work to do. How many of you believe that you still need to be beautified? Show of hands. Good. Now look around you, okay? Can we all agree that there isn't a single one of us who doesn't need constant cleansing and peeling? Can we agree that our spiritual pores need to be open to reveal what, what must be extracted in us so that we can truly be a representation of the beauty of Christ as God designed us to be? And if we all bear witness with one another in this, might we also learn how to be gracious with one another since we are all in need of beauty preparations? So the next time one of our sisters in Christ says something that offends us, and by the way, it's almost always unintentional. Might we stop and think about this moment and remember, she's being beautified just like me. And then pray for her, or him if it's your husband, or them if it's your children. They are being beautified just like us. I read a quote that said, a beautiful woman uses her lips for truth, her voice for kindness, her ears for compassion, her hands for charity, and her heart for love. For those who do not like her, she uses prayer. I want to be beautiful like that. And I believe that was Esther's mindset because she was competing to be queen against women. Let's keep it real, girls. We could be cray, okay? Catty, jealous, resentful, devious, and flat out ugly, can't we, if we let our flesh rule? But it, yet it says in verse 16 that Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her, not just the men, all who saw her. That could only have been possible if she had allowed the Lord to transform her. It was her inner beauty that set her apart and caused everyone to look favorably upon her. 1 Peter 3, 4 says, You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. 
In the Amplified Bible, a gentle and quiet spirit is one that is calm and self-controlled, not over-anxious, but serene and spiritually mature. Do you remember our memory verse from a few weeks ago? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. This should be our prayer on a daily basis. That's a strip away the ugly prayer. But be ready, because God is faithful to honor that prayer. He loves us too much not to. It may hurt. You may cry. You may want to smack his hand away and jump off that table. But remember, Jesus paid it all for you and me to reflect his beauty. We must comply and let him extract our blemishes, like the ones Trish gave us a few weeks ago. Unforgiveness, judging, bitterness, selfishness, apathy, pride, fear, worry, stubbornness, rebellion, disobedience, impatience, ingratitude, discontentment, complaining, gossip, murmuring, strife, anger, a critical spirit, lying, evil thoughts or actions, laziness, hypocrisy, idolatry, unfaithfulness, prayerlessness, procrastination, moral failure, compromise, and the list goes on. Ladies, the only way for these blemishes to be revealed and extracted is by the transforming power of his word. The word of God is our oil of myrrh. That mindset that this is just the way that I am, it's toxic. It's a lie straight from the pits of hell meant to halt your beautification. Don't believe it. 2 Corinthians 2.16 tells us that we have the mind of Christ, so let's start using it. Confess how you act in your flesh and remember who you are in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, you can do all things. If indeed you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you possess a power that is far above the power of sin. It is a power that makes it possible to be transformed more and more into the likeness of Christ, regardless of your past mistakes, regardless of your present circumstance, and regardless of your fears about your future. The same power that raised Jesus from the grave lives inside of us, Romans 8.11. His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, 2 Peter 1.3. We have the power to be beautified by his word, but we must be willing to strip away the ugly. Now, my third and final point is step forward. Step forward into the palace and fulfill your call. Let's read verse six, verses 16 to 21. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace. Verse 17, the king loved Esther more than all the other women and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Verse 20, now Esther had not revealed her family or people just as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. In those days when Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Big Thun and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when the inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on a gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Esther stepped forward into the palace, and she was crowned queen. She didn't come from a royal family, so this was uncharted territory for her, but she stepped forward nonetheless, trusting in God to help her navigate through her new role. As believers in Jesus, we are all called to fulfill a purpose. In fact, we have many calls throughout our lives, as a wife, as a mother, as a daughter, a sister. We have calls outside of the home, in our neighborhood, with our friends, in the workplace, and in the church. But no matter what the call is, we can't fulfill it if we don't step forward into the palace. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The Lord had prepared beforehand for Esther to become queen and have access to the king when the two eunuchs were plotting to kill him. And the Lord kept impressing upon my heart the importance of obedience and how our obedience impacts those around us. 
Esther's obedience thwarted an assassination plot against the king. She saved his life. The king had no idea how much he needed Esther to be obedient to what she was called to do. And ladies, there's no difference between Esther's situation and ours. Whether they know it or not, the people in your life are depending on your obedience to the Lord. I'm going to say that again. Whether they know it or not, the people in your life are depending on your obedience to the Lord. Whether your husband is a believer or not, he's depending on your obedience. Your children are depending on your obedience. Whether your coworkers are kind and upright or malicious and dishonest, they are depending on your obedience to the Lord. Step forward into the palace and fulfill your call. One of the leaders in my group, Araceli, was born in Mexico. She married an American, and a few years ago, she started the process to become a permanent resident. Last October, she had to travel back to Mexico for her appointment with the immigration office. So she and her husband drove the nine hours to her appointment, and they told her that she needed to stay in Mexico for at least two weeks before she could learn the outcome of her application. Her husband needed to return to the U.S. for work, so he left without her. Araceli was not near her family, but God, through a friend, arranged for her to stay with the relatives of that friend near the immigration office. Just imagine, your husband drives away. You don't know when or if you'll see him anytime soon. Your daughter is back in the U.S., and you're staying with strangers. Araceli could have succumbed to the fear of not knowing what the future held for her, but that's not what she did at all. Instead, she went shopping. <laughs> Retail therapy, right? That really wasn't what it was because the Lord had placed a call on Araceli's life that day. While she was walking around the mall, she saw a woman sitting by herself. Prompted by the Holy Spirit, my shy Araceli asked that woman if she was okay. This woman had just learned that her husband had an affair. Again, moved by the Spirit, Araceli shared the gospel with her, and she accepted the Lord right there and began to cry. Through tears, she shared that she was sitting there planning her suicide. This woman was depending on Araceli's obedience and didn't even know it, but it saved her life. Ladies, others are depending on our obedience. We must step forward into the palace and fulfill our call. If you're married and you have one foot in and one foot out of the marriage, you need to step forward into the palace with both feet. Be all in. Whether your marriage is thriving or whether it needs to be healed, step forward and watch what the Lord can do. If you're single and you're living a life of compromise, you're not legally married and you're having sex with that guy, your boyfriend or your fiance, let me tell you, ladies, there is no such thing as partial purity. And we single gals, we are called to be pure. Step forward into the palace and fulfill your call with integrity. Ladies, don't be afraid of the call, for it is God who works in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Step forward into the palace, declaring like Job, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. The miracle that the Lord wants to do in and through you begins inside the palace. So step forward and fulfill your call, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. In closing, we have a choice to make. Will you stand firm and say, I am counting on the Lord? Yes, I am counting on him. I have put my hope in his word. Will you strip away the ugly to be beautified, remembering that he gave up his life for the church to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word? He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she would be holy and without fault. And lastly, will you step forward into the palace and fulfill your call, knowing that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just give you glory because glory is due, Father God. You are a magnificent, majestic God. Lord, we don't know why you love us, but you love us, and we praise you. 
Lord, and we thank you for this time and the time that will proceed uh, this time, Father God, as we fellowship. Lord, will you continue to do a work in us, continue to beautify us, Father God. Show us where we need our blemishes to be extracted. Encourage us where we need to stand firm and surrender, Lord God, and give us the strength to step forward into the palace and fulfill the call that you have prepared beforehand. Thank you for this time, Lord God. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.